So, internet animation is pretty fun, right? I don't think there's much to say when it comes to the topic that hasn't been said that much before. There's been a long history of animators who've made starts on Newgrounds or YouTube that are now bona fide animation legends. Harry Partridge, Ego Raptor, Rubber Ninja, and a whole lot more have carved their names into the online space with their skill and creativity. That being said, there's also existed an evolution to this. We've gone from fully well known and produced animations with truckloads of polish to them over the years, to creators being able to make their own series and make a name for themselves even in the professional field. Lackadaisy, Homestar Runner, Big Top Burger, and of course, Hasbin Hotel. Say what you want about the whole Vivzipop brand going on, she'll always be a controversial figure when it comes to the internet. There's not a doubt in my mind that Spittlehorse's 2 series as well as their other animations have wowed so many people. Like massive props to the team behind these projects, they really know their stuff. And with Hasbin currently being produced under the A24 banner, I'm sure when it hits our screens they'll do it again for sure. That being said, Helva being Spittlehorse's one ongoing series as of the time this is being written, has done pretty well for itself over its now 2 season run, with each episode bursting with creativity from an animation, voice acting, and musical perspective. The voice actors they brought on for the project, being a mix of industry and internet voice talent, doing incredible work. Their ability to switch animation styles as well as music never ceasing to amaze me. There's a lot to admire here. However, there's no denying that a series like this has flaws. Every other thing does. And before anyone types anything, yes, I'm aware of the hive mind the fanbase for the show is, going after so many people for pointing out the show's issues. So I might as well cover my tracks. Attention virgins! The following video is for criticism only! Please don't tear me a new one in the comments! Thank you! Everything good? Alright, so let's dive into the many flaws of Hell of a Boss. Damn it. Stolas, this is a really bad time! Mm. When isn't it a bad time, Blitzy? Probably one of the most major issues with Hell of a Boss, and probably the producer of most of its issues, is its main couple. Stolas is established pretty early on in the series to be a hot mess, beginning as an affair between Hell's royalty Stolas and one of our main four, Blitz. The couple have been one of, if not the most celebrated aspects of the series up until now. I'm not gonna sit here and deny that the first season didn't delve heavily into these characters and what makes them tick. Truth Serum is a prime example of this, doing more than its fair share and showing Blitz's insecurities and his habit of pushing people away. I consider it one of my favorite episodes of season 1, but here's one of my biggest issues issues with Stolitz. It takes all focus away from other characters development wise. Throughout the first season, it's pretty much considered the Blitz and Stolitz show. Don't get me wrong, they try to develop other characters mostly, but it's as few and far between as you can get. A good example of this is Moxie. Time after time, they give him the same plot in episodes, standing up for himself and building up his confidence. But that's just it. The show loves to hit its magical status quo button and he's back to being the same. Even in arguably one of the best moments in the show, Moxie has an opportunity to show what he's learned throughout the series with him giving his father a legit threat and he quickly gets taken out and the rest of the episode plays out as is. No development outside of those two sticks. It also brings light into what I consider another big issue with the series as a whole, but we'll get into that later. With that being said, this issue does tend to trickle down into other issues like the end of season 1 and the beginning of season 2. Aussies is a big episode for the series. It pretty much throws a scalpel into the deep issues of its main character and exposes bits and pieces of his dark past right in front of everyone. He's torn, deciding to push everyone away. Octavia is with her mother this weekend, so we could... I'm not fucking you tonight, okay? I'm really just... I'm really not in the mood, Stolas. We could talk, or watch a movie, or... Maybe cuddle? Solus, don't act like what we have is anything but you wanting me to fuck you, okay? You make that really clear all the time. But I just, I, I can't do it tonight, okay? I'm sorry. This even continues on to the next episode, Queen Bee. That very episode ends with Blitz openly admitting his one fear of everyone leaving his side, the very reason why he acts the way he does with IMP. I actually considered one of the series' best episodes, and what does it decide to do in its second season? Act like nothing ever happened. Hey, yo, what the fuck? Yep. So far after Aussies, we see why Solitz exists in season 2's first episode, albeit heavily retconned to make it look like those two were childhood friends before, but in Seeing Stars, we're given the context that it's after the whole interaction between the two, and the show just kinda acts like it never happened. That's not good. Like you had a whole build-up and crushing scene between the two. Surely, after all that, you would expect at least one awkward moment between the two. At least a scene where they find it hard to communicate. But nope, just business as usual. Blitz, we don't have time for this. Fear could be anywhere. She could be in danger. Don't worry, I'm on it. And with this problem being handled this badly so far, this is one of the many issues Helvabas seems to be burdened with, and the biggest. But it doesn't end there. But guilty and innocent aren't our.
our business, Mox. Killing who we're paid to is our business. Uh -huh, Shoot the target. Honey. It's no surprise that if you pay attention to the series as a whole, you'd notice a lot of focus being put on three characters, Blitz, Moxie, and Stolas, the previous two getting the most attention. From touching on Blitz's past to Moxie's rough as hell experience with the mob, these are decent plots that aim to go into detail about who these characters are and their insecurities and trauma, delving deep and giving us more of a clear understanding of who these people are. On the flip side of that is the other half of IMP, Luna and Millie. Two characters that I'd make the argument are treated very unfairly in the series' episodes. Time after time, these two have gotten the opportunity to have an episode to themselves, or have gotten development at some point and instantly lose it since the series' creative team decided that they wanted to press the big reset button for season 2. It's unfair to viewers who want to see these characters grow and change because if it keeps happening, then there would be no use in being invested in the story this far. Millie's the biggest point to be brought up in this case, as she was the one that initially made me want to start talking about this point. Up until now, yes, even including season 2, Millie's only been known as Helva Boss's muscle and being Moxie's wife. And yes, while the two are extremely wholesome together, they're also unable to be written on their own and are more of a package deal in episodes. Or rather, Millie can be written on her own. But how are you so sure, Mr. Toons? Why just look at the episodes where the focus is on them as characters? Murder Family, Millie doesn't get to do much. Lululand, Millie and Moxie are paired together. Same with Spring Broken and Cherubs. Harvest Moon Festival especially gets me because we get introduced to Millie's parents and her home. We could have gotten some great development with Millie here, showing how strong she's gotten after leaving Wrath. But no. The episode quickly becomes focused on Moxie and sidelines Millie throughout. Truth Seekers, focuses mainly on Moxie and Blitz. Ozzy and Queen Bee, Blitz episodes. It doesn't even end there. Season 2 continues the trend with episodes like Seeing Star Stars, X's and O's, and Western Energy, where those two are still kept joint at the hip. But what about Unhappy Campers, I hear? While rewatching it now, I see some improvement with Millie getting some sort of spotlight on her, but it's still under the shadow of a Moxie and Millie episode. I see so many people celebrate it, but, in my opinion of course, the episode could have had a lot more of a clear focus without ham-fisting both a Blitz subplot and Moxie being the victim of punching down. Gives me crazy Clone High Season 2 vibes looking back. Honestly, my biggest issue with Millie being used this way is whereas the guys get a ton of time towards their respective arcs and episodes, the series will continue to shaft Millie to a point where I feel viewers won't be able to call her a worthy member of the cast. There is development here, don't get me wrong, but it's scattered across multiple episodes in small chunks, and that's so disappointing. We need to see an episode where she handles it solo, or with someone else that isn't Moxie or Blitz, or even an origin episode, because up until now her development has been more than a bit underwhelming. Now when it comes to Millie, the one take I've seen that is just objectively not true is that we don't think about her and we aren't planning on doing more with her as the biggest slash sole focus later on. We absolutely are. She gets her episodes of the season but we are literally on three. I think my personal issue with how she is characterised is that her only personality is being Moxie's wife. But I do get it. When writing two married leads who are a newlywed couple, there is a lot of focus on their dynamic together and Moxie's had more plots outside of that. Millie's are coming, but I do feel like some ignore the character we are giving her in episodes where she isn't the sole focus. She is resourceful. She has strong family ties and memories. She has a past of violence. She has a sibling rivalry. She's excitable and hyper-focused. Oh, you look perfect, Looney. Like always. Shut up, Dad! Oh, <laughs> Next up would be IMP's receptionist Luna. While not as in with the main trio as Millie is, she does have a rather pressing issue of any and all development being completely shafted in the second season. Within season 1, we don't really get to know her as much, but in the little we do see, there's more than a few hints of her being an emotionally distant hellhound that struggles to socialize with people outside of her co-workers at IMP. While yes, this development starts and is helped along the way thanks to Blitz, it still does a lot more for Luna in season 1 than Millie ever could. Spring Broken is what initially piqued this interest for me. No, not that interest. You little nasty. <laughs> There's a certain scene that takes place within the episode where Luna blows up at Blitz for wanting to talk to the new hellhound Tex, later on feeling remorse but not being able to translate that into a half-decent apology, but instead giving us this. He'll get over it. He always does. In Truth Seekers, their bond is given more proof in a little moment where Blitz, completely having a real call to action, orders Luna to shut down the portal back to hell with them outside. In Luna's own words, Blitz was using a total of zero euphemisms, innuendos, or swears. That means it was serious. As well as that, in arguably one of the best moments of the series, we see her jump in front of him, stopping a weapon mid-air from harming him. With these two episodes in mind, it was clear to me that Luna, at least as a character, is good at expressing herself through her actions and not her words. Caring about her father but not being able to to express it well. This reaches its peak in the episode Queen Bee. 
where she gets invited to a party hosted by Beelzebub and Tex. After being discouraged by a few interactions, her first reaction is to immediately call for Blitz to get her home. But after getting sweet talk, she gives the party one final try. With her father being there and being the life of the party, Loon is given the chance to socialize and actually have a good time. But of course, the episode does come after Ozzy's, so Blitz naturally wouldn't be doing so good in the mental health department. The episode ends in the same way I mentioned previously, Blitz letting his emotions and fears spill in a state, with Luna reassuring him that she'll be there for her dad. Fuck, Fizz was right. I'm gonna die alone, aren't I? Just a wrinkly, old, weathered waste. Will you be there, Looney? Beware. Uh, it's lonely. I won't die alone. I'll be there, Dad. Wow, what a wholesome way to end the season. I'm sure they'll continue with this type of development for the next- Well, I'm so sorry. I'll never replace you no matter what you- <laughs> You're good. Yep, as soon as the second episode of season 2 starts, the series just couldn't resist that status quo and reverted Luna to an even worse state than season 1. Whereas in the first season, she was more than a little easily aggravated, we get introduced to her just going rabid and attacking Blitz when met with a little criticism. We lost all that development, all that understanding of a character for absolutely nothing. Sure, later on in the episode, we see her give a well-made pep talk to Via, but there's no merit to it. Nothing that says this was worth it. I feel like we lost what could have been a great adoptive father-daughter story in favor of more comedic moments, and that to me is just kind of defeating. Let me hear you say all right. Oh, I can't spell. I can't read either. The hell these shot, you fucking really can't say that word anymore. <laughs> The issues don't end there either. This might just be me, but it feels like for the most part, season 1 does manage to hold itself pretty well. Dropping the points I made about Millie and Luna for a second, in the season, there was a genuine attempt to keep episodes connected, although this isn't always to the series' benefit. With this mindset the team has, there's a massive deviation from the series' main concept. At the start, Halifa Boss was a comedy focusing on these imps starting an assassination business. Apart from the show's pilots, a total one episode actually has the IMP going after a higher target, that being the first episode, Murder Family. With other episodes in season one maybe balancing this alongside other plots, it designates for itself. Other shows would make more episodes to detail the show's premise before getting into heavy character stuff, but not here apparently. And in season two, just going all in on world building and character focused storytelling. The issue being that it doesn't stick with what it's set up. Now, I'm a guy who loves this story-driven stuff. This is fine if, for example, it was a one-time thing, but it isn't. The entire season's changed. The status quo resets in full effect. So there's established details that were there before, like Moxie living in wrath, but Helva Boss changed it to him being raised in greed under a mob boss father, a detail that members of the Spindle Horse crew have had to go on social media to clear up, and that just makes less sense. Points of clarification, Moxie was indeed born in wrath. His mom is from there. However, he was raised and spent most of his life in greed, hence his not very country vibe, or Rathian values. Hashtag hell of a boss. The pacing of certain episodes are also a big issue. I could go on and on about X's and O's and Harvest Festival not being satisfying ends to their respective plots. Instead switching from a serious moment where main characters could lose their lives to a comedy bit where Moxie gets thwacked with a door. Who's weak now? Okay, I'm here. Like, what's the payoff here? It's a fun episode, don't get me wrong, but nothing feels complete, like it's stringing you along by doing this. If this keeps up, people would still watch for sure, but any and all cohesion in the story would get noticed sooner or later, whether people point it out or not. This is it over! What the? An 
issue that most people that critique the series don't seem to get into is the rampant villain problem with Hell of a Boss in its current state. At the time of writing this, the series has established a total of seven villains. Striker, Ferocica, Fizzaroli, Crimson, Stella, the Cherubs, and the Dorks. Don't get me wrong, some of these oppositions being here do help move along some of the world building of Hasbin Hotel and Hell of a Boss. Striker, for example, showing that there is harm to come towards Hell's royalty by the introduction of blessed weapons. The Cherubs showing that there are other forces that do exist outside of the denizens of Hell and the regular world. And the secret government agency Dorks presenting what could possibly happen to the regular world with proof that actual humans are aware of these creatures and have somehow lived to tell the tale. But, personally for me, as a guy who loves to see our main characters go head to head with their villains, this might be, emphasis on might be, a little too much thrown at us at once for both seasons 1 and 2. Currently, we've seen the return of Striker making good on his promise. In terms of the others, however, we've gotten close to zero. The thing is, with each one of them going, I'll get you next time, or this isn't over, you're expected to see them again at some point. But the show in its current state seems to be more concerned with fleshing out more and more of the world building and newer characters. And in the process, maybe, just maybe, going back to its main four to offer a bit of development and that's it. Putting a hold on villains would be fine in any other show, but here, I get the feeling that by juggling so much, they'll eventually lose sight of them. Don't believe me? Take a look at the episode where Striker makes a return, Western Energy. While Striker seems like himself from episodes past, Stella seems more dumbed down. Don't get me wrong, I don't know a ton about her, mostly because the show hasn't shown much, but I don't think the same person that openly admitted to staying with Stolas in their crappy marriage to play mind games with him would forget about the child owning everything if he dies. It just doesn't seem right. You've already produced an heir. When he dies, his duties, his possessions, his allegiance, it will all pass to the heir. So, if you kill him, you would... Hmm? Laugh? <laughs> No, you stupid cow! You get nothing! Villains are the third most important part to a story right next to the plot and our main characters. So seeing them thrown by the wayside and brought back whenever doesn't necessarily make me feel excited for whatever comes next. At the end of the day, I don't want anyone coming out of this video thinking that I despise Hell of a Boss. I really don't. I actually massively enjoy the series, characters, and what it's trying to establish, but thought putting my two cents into the debate would help others understand where I'm coming from. I know there's no stopping people from leaving essay after essay on how I'm wrong. Trust me, the last video I made showed me that enough. But I'm still excited for what Vivzy Pop and the team could possibly do, even with my grabs with the show in mind. Here's hoping they could turn it around somehow. It's gonna be a great day today to get some fresh air like a stray on a straightaway. Hey you, got a light now, nah, a bud light. Early in the morning, face crud from like a mud fight. Looky here, it's just the way the cookie tear. Prepare to get hurt and mangled like Kurt Angle rookie year. The rocket scientist with the pocket wireless. Some even say he might need some psychiatrist. Doom, are you pondering what I'm pondering? Yes, why would the darn thing be wandering? She's just a foundling, barely worth fondling. My posse's on Broadway, like mama, I want to sing. Mad plays the bass like the race card. Villain in the place to break shards and leave a face scarred. Groovy dude, not to prove to be rude, but this stuff is like what you might put on movie food. Uh -huh.